Welcome to another Good Dads podcast. I am Jay Foch alongside Dr. Jennifer Baker, and we have some special guests today via Zoom and our podcast. Yes, this is part of our What Do You Want to Be When You Grow Up series, and we're very grateful to two public servants here who are going to talk to us about why someone might want to encourage their child to consider a job in public service or a child who's listening might say, you know, maybe I want to be that or I want to do that. And uh, how do I get there? So we have uh, right below me, we have Chief Paul Williams, who's the chief of the Springfield Police Department. And next to him, we have Scott Moore, who is the fire chief of the Battle Battlefield Police De uh, Fire Department. <laughs> Fire Fire District. He, he wants yeah. to be a policeman. They all firemen want to be policemen. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's whatever. <laughs> he just wants to carry a gun. Is that it? <laughs> I can honestly say I am one, so it, it goes both ways. It's good. <laughs> well, maybe Chief Williams, will you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, and then we'll let uh, uh, Chief Moore tell us about what he does. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so my name is Paul Williams. I'm the police chief here in Springfield, Missouri. I just celebrated my 10th year as the chief here in Springfield, uh, but I have a career in law enforcement spanning almost four decades. Uh, graduated in college in 1981 in Michigan, moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I became a police officer and worked there for 29 years, pretty much all aspects of the department, and moved uh, throughout the ranks as I did that, um, and then retired and, and came here. Um, so, and I could, I mean, my resume, I made, I, I don't want to just recite that. So kind of tailored to what we're talking about today, I thought I'd share that I'm a third generation law enforcement officer. My my father uh, was a police officer in Detroit, Michigan, retired as a sergeant after 25 years uh, in uh, the 80s. And my grandfather was a police officer in Detroit as well and retired as a motorcycle officer uh, back in the 40s. So um, about uh, 90 years of law enforcement policing experience uh, in my family. Uh, that's a that's a pretty uh, a pretty good accomplishment, I think, uh, for uh, uh, my family, but also uh, a good testament to the policing profession about uh, uh, what it means to folks to be part of that. Yes, I have to tell you, I'm a fan of Blue Bloods, so I you know I'm on season eight <laughs> right now. <laughs> Thanks to Netflix. Are you saying, are you saying <laughs> Selleck? <laughs> yeah, you're Tom Selleck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Striking resemblance. <laughs> Not quite. Thank you, Chief say. Moore. <laughs> uh, Chief Moore, can you tell us about yourself? Sure. So uh, for those, I'm Scott Moore. The I'm the fire chief of the Battlefield Fire District. This is my 26th year in the fire service, um, my eighth year with Battlefield, and then I'm within my first year. Um, October, well, October is my one year for being the fire chief. So, um, spent several years at the Nixa Fire District as a child growing up. I, 14 was uh, when I started with the fire service there and uh, moved up through the ranks, as the typical saying goes. Um, but I volunteered for the first 10 years of my career. So, uh, I just in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, there weren't a lot of options for career agencies in the fire service. So, I just always assumed that it was the fire service was a volunteer aspect. I didn't think they were going to actually pay me to do this. This is like excellent. So, uh, but honestly, my my family background is all in the electrical trade. Everyone that every one of my cousins and uncles and aunts and my father, my grandfather, everybody's an electrician. So that was kind of my background in trade. So I went through the the IBW apprenticeship uh, for a few years and realized that, that well, that's not just for everybody. So and then I took my stint as a law enforcement officer, and I'm 21 years as a deputy sheriff for the Christian County Sheriff's Office and still there today as a corporal. And, um, all those things in public safety just all wrapped up into what I felt like was my calling and my, and my way to give. My, you know, where was I going to be able to give? And public safety just feels natural for that. Um, so uh, I have an incident management team and emergency management background. And, it's just all encompassing into public safety, and I think that's the 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 real nature. Whether we, we do poke back and forth between the, the cops and the firemen, and um, <laughs> but it's a it's a friendly it's rivalry because we're all here. Best of both worlds, because I often say firefighting is a part time job, and, and, and 
being a police officer is full time. So you get to do both because of that. I, I think that's yeah. great. Yeah, absolutely. Right. <laughs> so I, I do. I like the I like the variation. I like to know um, the different types and, and what goes on. And I really I think it rounds people out to, to not just have one thing um, that um, that they're familiar with. And um, so whether it's your teacher or you're educating or or however you're doing it, uh, that constant, that constant growth. So, so I, I, I am curious. Go ahead, Jay. No, I, I just had to ask before we, we go any further, because I know we're talking about careers. What were you doing at age 14? Were they, were they sent, were you like the little guy and they would send you into tight <laughs> spots that they couldn't fit in? Or, <laughs> no, I was, I would I just, would no, I mean, seriously relief. though. Yeah, I would be the comic relief probably more than anything else, yes. but the, no, it was it was just an opportunity to grow and, and understand the family dynamic and aspect of it. No, they weren't sending us into burning buildings, but honestly, we were only going like 200 calls a year back then. Anyway, well, that's a month for us now. So uh, it's just a an op it's different because we were learning. It's almost like Boy Scouts. We were a, a small group, like a pack. There was probably eight of us that were in that um, group of cadet firefighters back then. And we learned skills. They would let us do certain things, and they just prepared us. Uh, so when we did turn 18 and we could buy fire, that we would be ready to be a part of it. Spent a lot of days running to the fire station, only to be kicked off the fire truck because somebody else there could actually go and do work. Uh, but I did it, and I got the experience and the time and the fun to do it. So that I ran to my first house fire, by the way. <laughs> I was going to say, that's interesting because we, we have a cadet program as well in the police department, age 16 to 20. So, and it's volunteers, as Scott was talking about, firefighting. And, and they, they go through a short academy. They get a, a feel for and a taste for what policing would be. Mm. Um, and they age out at age 20 because age 21 is when you can join the police academy. So we do that for two reasons. One, to kind of do what Scott was talking about, give you a, kind of an inkling if you're a young person and you think you might want to be a police officer. It's, it's a great environment and, and safe, and, and we don't let them go on police calls or anything like that, but they, they get to interact with, with police officers. They get to go on ride-alongs. They get to do some volunteer things, like uh, when we have special events or uh, National Night Out or the fair, you know, they, they get a uniform and they get to go out and uh, work with an officer and do that. So, um, and we do get some recruits out of that who then uh, go into policing, but I think uh, you mentioned it's like the Boy Scouts. It's kind of like a uh, a, a troop like that where they get to experience different things learn skills and then regardless of what they do they can go on and do anything in life they've they've learned some of that that leadership and that that uh, service mindset and that accountability uh by working with us and uh and if they want to be a police officer great they want to take those skills and go do something else that's good as well well, I was going to ask you if either one of you at 16 or 17 thought you were going to be doing what you're doing today, but in some respects, you both did. I mean, you had a generational thing and you were, but I don't know, sometimes people don't want to do what their parents do also. So I'll, I'll take that for yes and no. Um, I, I wanted to be a, be a cop since I was five. I mean, that's when I first remember it. And so partly, you know, it's, it's a family thing, but uh, I just, I've just always loved the aspect of being a you know public minded and a public servant and helping people and the fact that it's inside it's outside every day literally is different um now did i expect i was going to be the chief of police no uh my goal uh, yeah, if you heard earlier my dad retired as a sergeant my goal is always to be a lieutenant so i could make it one step higher than him <laughs> uh, as, as he reminded me regularly it didn't matter especially when i became the chief he's still the boss you know uh, he he was still Sarge. He was still my dad. So, uh, but that was a goal. If you if you uh, that I did have to join the police department, move into a command position. Um, so, yes, always thought I'd be doing this, but no, I didn't think I'd be doing it in this role, and I certainly didn't think I'd be doing it forty years later. Yeah, cool. You're like the Wyatt Earp family. <laughs> it's like everybody, everybody's in law enforcement. You there, just can't. There's another one, man. <laughs> and I've got I've got cousins and uncles. I had a uncle, a great uncle, was a fireman. I've got cousins who, uh, who are police officers. So we're it's in and in the military. So it's we are a public service. Uh, uh, find your calling and dive into it type family. Um, and I'll throw into that. My mom was a teacher. My mother in law is a teacher. My daughter just graduated. Is going to be a teacher. So I consider teachers in that that. Uh, public servant uh, and uh, profession as well. 
Yeah. Well, I think we all want to, um, we want to help make our parents proud. Right. And, and I think I gave that the go and went to the trade and did the thing, but really what it boiled down to is my parents just wanted me to be happy. And my dad wanted me to do whatever I was going to be able to do to be successful and, and dive into it. Like Chief Williams is saying, go after whatever it is you're going to go after and just do that. And if it's not the electrical trade, I'm disappointed, but it's not my dream. It's yours. So, uh, you know, the support that I have for my dad and my grandfather, I mean, that, my family's very much so involved in that trade, the electrical trade, enough that my grandfather's name's on the building in Springfield. And it, it's just, that was the life that it was meant to be, but that's not necessarily what it has to be as long as we were happy and we were successful in doing what we, what we loved. So. so what do you think changed your mind uh, or pulled you away from, you know, the work with, as an electrician to fire, right? Uh -huh. Well, I think just the progression of the fire service in general in Southwest Missouri, going from you know ninety percent of a volunteer agencies to you know there's thirteen agencies in Green County and nine of them are careers. So uh, back then, Springfield and one or two full time people here in the Republic. That's about all you got, and uh, so that changed for me dramatically. But then also, um, I don't know. It's just a, it comes a time in your life where it kind of hits you in the face, like. I've done all these other things and trying it, but here's something that I've done for 10 years for free. Why wouldn't I, you know, I'm obviously love it enough. Why wouldn't I just do it and make that a lifestyle and a career and the schedule and all the things that were nice about it. Uh, it just, it changed my mind and I don't have to dig ditches and I don't have to bend pipe and I don't have to pull wire. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to work in a stinky factory. You know, like there's just personal things for me, like the things that I didn't enjoy. And I have to listen to my dad get on to me every day because Sometimes working for dad is not a, always the greatest thing. So, Dicks in general with your dad is, is very exciting. <laughs> I can imagine like your career every day with him. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So what would you guys tell um, dads whose sons or daughters might be thinking about law enforcement or fire service? Um, and maybe that's like you, Scott, they don't have that background it, and they're just going into it new. So the dad doesn't know very much about it. So what would you tell those dads? I'd like to hear from both of you on that. Chief, you want to do the law side first? Sure, I'll, I'll start. And I've got two perspectives on it as a, uh, so I'm from a law enforcement family, but I can also uh, um, appreciate someone who's never had any background and, and wants to help their community and serve in that role. So, um, so I'll start with a, a little personal story. My son, he's a, he's a senior in, 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 uh, in high school, getting ready to start this year. And, and uh, I've always, I'm going to echo what Scott said. I've always told him, do whatever makes you happy. Find something you love and, and do it. I said, I've been doing this for 40 years. I still love putting this uniform on and coming to work every day. I really do. I mean, it's, it's certainly got, good days and bad days but overall it's it's been a rewarding career and I, I i would still be doing it if i didn't didn't enjoy it and so i've told him that find something you love and and he's been all over the map for the last five years um i'll, I'll give you some extremes he at one point he wanted to be a marine biologist another point he wanted to be a minister um and then pretty much everything in between well in the last year or so he's settled on law enforcement um, and it's not that I've pushed him that way or encouraged him. Uh, I've simply, you know, asked questions and, and whatever he wants to do. And, and uh, he, he came home one day and, and said, I think I want to do what you do. Um, so it certainly makes you proud when, it, when your, your son says that. But so I've had that a long talk with him. And my wife's not as enamored with the idea, by the way, as, as I am. Uh, but uh, I, the, the talk was, you know, it's a calling and it's an experience and it's a profession. It's rewarding. It's, it, uh, it can, it's a, it, you'll be able to have a good life, but you're not going to get rich by any stretch of imagination. And it, and it certainly has its, has its ups and downs. Uh, but it's, it's certainly something that I cannot say has not been uh, enjoyable and something I wouldn't encourage people to go into. So he's thinking about that. Um, and I will encourage him if that's what he wants to do. He's going to go to college and get a degree and then see what he wants to do. Um, so that's the personal aspect. And certainly four generations would be, that'd be pretty cool. I'll be honest with you, you know, uh, to be able to continue that tradition. Um, 
but the second part, and Jennifer, I shared this with this little story with you the other day. Um, I was at a uh, law enforcement executive development, development seminar um, last year, and there's 50 or so chiefs and sheriffs from around the country. And we're talking about recruiting and retention, and uh, one of the chiefs had mentioned that, um, you know, uh, in answer to the question, would you encourage your son or daughter uh, to go into law enforcement? The answer was absolutely not. Um, and her response was, it's fresh and changed. Uh, you know, the, the community sentiment across the country has turned. Um, it's been a great career for me, but I would not want my child to go into that. And that kind of spurred the discussion. And, and the room was kind of split at, at that point about whether that was something you would encourage or not. And I listened to the discussion for about 15, 20 minutes. And then I, I, I said, I've got to say something. Um, so I shared what I just did about you know my, my family. But um, I said, as a chief or a sheriff or a colonel, how can you go out and ask people, we're talking about recruiting, ask someone to say, come work for me, give me your son or daughter to come work for me and keep people safe, become a police officer. If you can't say the same thing to your own child, if your child comes to you and says, hey dad, hey mom, I wanna be a, I wanna be a cop, and your answer is absolutely not, go find something else to do, then really you shouldn't be a chief or a sheriff or a colonel. You ought, you ought to go find something else to do. Because I can't in good conscience uh, say yes to someone else's son or daughter and say no to my own. Uh, mm -hmm. Because it is, it, it, and I, so I encourage people, it's not for everybody. <laughs> I understand that. It is absolutely a calling uh, to be able to do what we do and to, uh, to be able to survive any number of years doing what we do. And I see it with every recruit class. Um, yeah, we had, we started with 13, two weeks ago, we're down to 10. Um, people even get into the academy and they go, oh, wait a minute, I really didn't expect this, or I didn't think this, or they get out into field training. Uh, and now it's, it's real. Um, or you do it for three, four, five, 10, 15 years, and you decide, nope, it's, it's not just for me, I can't, I can't handle it anymore, then I wish people well, and I say, go find something else to do so you're happy, uh, and you're not a detriment in our profession in dealing with people on the street, because if you're not happy and enjoying what you're doing, that's absolutely going to come across in, uh, in your work. So um, long answer to your question, but I'll say that the short answer is I absolutely um, encourage people, if they're interested in a, in, a, in a life of public service, to consider law enforcement. And if your child is interested, man, have them come talk to me. I won't, uh, I won't sugarcoat it, but uh, I will certainly offer the, the insight they need to make an informed decision. And that goes for my kids and your kids. Great, thank you. Thank you, we appreciate that. Cause I know I sometimes have people coming to see me cause their parents sent them to see me. So that was part of the impetus for this series. It's like, <laughs> hey, now you get, you get a chance to hear what different people have to say, so. It's like when people come to me and they go, should I get into radio? And I say, absolutely not. <laughs> so I guess I'm kind of, I'm kind of Why? where you're talking about, Chief Williams. <laughs> I think competition's a little different in the radio world. Yeah. <laughs> We've got former radio guys who are cops. So, you know, we get bored with doing what you're doing, man. Come on, we're we're continuously investing. <laughs> 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 they probably have that fitness fitness regimen, Jay, that you're longing for. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. There you yeah. go. Yeah. You got to be in kind of shape to get here, but I, yeah, we'll we'll maintain that. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope that there's a little bit more drive than just getting fitness done. If I'm going to go in law enforcement, I hope there's some other drive there. <laughs> that, that, that is not the primary motivation. Trust me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, to Jay's point, the, the, the why, and that's the, when I was thinking about this, this answer, to me, it's find your why. And if as the parent of that child, find the why, because uh, one of my, uh, we're going through promotional exams for uh, new positions with us and, and officer positions. And one of the questions I ask those candidates is, you're, you're promoted, you're at a chief officer level, or you're at, a, at an officer level, you've put on the white shirt, you're, the car is in your driveway. Um, you know, the, what, what are you scared of, first off, and then what are three things that you said you would do for yourself once you made that, that leap? And I'm amazed at how many people can't answer three things that they would do for themselves. And I, I tell them, this is selfish time. This is the time where you get to, because the motivation has to be personal. 
Um, otherwise, because Chief Williams is right, it is not always rainbows and butterflies. There are tough, <laughs> tough days. And there are days when you're gonna uh, second guess or question your decision. And But personal motivation is what keeps you coming back day after day. And um, you know, I've, I made terrible choices as an early firefighter um, learning how to be an adult. And um, it wasn't until I had to stand in front of a board of directors and fight for my job along with my officer that I realized that it's, there's a personal why, there's a personal choice here that has to be made. And um, you know, so we take our, our experiences and we move on, but the, that personal motivation lives. So, and then for the parent as well is, um, for me, having folks that did not come from the fire service or public safety, um, you know, is my dad's opinion of what I needed to be doing or should be doing wasn't a gospel. Um, I, something else was preaching to me. So something else was coming up um, and continuing to rear his head. So he allowed me to pay attention to it. And that's allow your kids to pay attention to the things that are important. I have a 16 year old daughter and she is in love with horses. If you could find a job where she could make $2 an hour to pet a horse all day long, she would <laughs> gladly go do that. Um, but Sarah, she loves horses. So her first job, she's 16. She got her first job. She's a stable hand at a, at a local stable. And I swore up and down. That I said, you need to get a job at a grocery store or something, something expendable, right, for that first job. No, she proved me completely wrong. And she is loving life, mucking stalls, and coming home smelling like everything she can. And, you know, so I, I just really she feel happy like. She's happy and you're happy, right? <laughs> That's right. And she's working in a barn, you know, like I, I, I can't complain. She's got a job. She's paying her bills and, and she's 16 years old. She gets to work at six o'clock in the morning too. I have no idea wow. where that gene came from, but it didn't come from me. So. <laughs> so what about, you know, sometimes the elephant in the room with either a military career or law enforcement or fire service is the danger associated with that. What would you say to a parent who says, well, and what, what Keith, uh, what Kevin Weaver told us is they took heat from other parents who said, why would you want your son to be in the military service? That's dangerous. Don't you care about him? So how do you guys answer that question? So I'll start, you know, every, every outdoor profession is dangerous. I mean, and policing, uh, it's dangerous, um, but I, I qualify that. It's not the most dangerous job on the planet. Uh, it never shows up in the top 10. I mean, you got loggers and, and deep sea fishermen and, and uh, linemen at uh, the electrical service that, you know, yeah. that are always higher. Um, but policing is the only job where the danger comes from other people. All those other things I've talked about, you know, it's, it's nature, it's, it's things that uh, make the job dangerous. But, uh, you know, policing is one of those where you're dependent on human nature and that's where the danger is going to come from. That's what makes it unique. And I think that's what uh, makes it even more dangerous because people are unpredictable. Um, and even if you do everything right, um, you can still get seriously hurt or killed. And that's, that's, the, that's the nature of the job. And that's something I'm very upfront with people about. Um, you know, when, you're, when you talk about a 150 you know, officers killed every year uh, from the actions of other people, that's, uh, that's significant. Um, you know, there's 800,000 police officers in the United States and there's 300 million people. So there's a lot of interactions that go on that don't result in, uh, in someone uh, hurting or killing a police officer. So it's a concern. Um, it's, and it's, it's, it's one of those things that some people join the academy and one of the first, first day or two, we, we talk about that and we show videos and pictures. And, and I've had people get up and walk out after that presentation and go oh no I'm not putting myself in in that position where that can happen to me but then after that you know it's like okay that's the elephant in the room as you talked about Jennifer and we address that right up front and say now look at all the all the good things you can do with your life and the impact a positive impact you can have on people's lives and and how you can keep people safe um, and then move forward and, and don't dwell on that it's always it's always in the back of your mind it's always in the back of my mind uh, but uh, you know it's not something that that uh, I think should be the, the determining factor on whether or not you're going to do this job. Thank you. I would agree. I think that uh, that's a really great way to break it down and to show, because there's so many positives that outweigh 
the fear and the and the unknown, the uncertainty of of what we do, and um, the the idea that we're going to put ourselves in, in harm's way for other folks. Um, that's the natural instinct to it, almost than more than it is anything else. It's um, it, it's just what we find ourselves willing to do. Um, yeah, it's dangerous, but it's no more dangerous than my daughter at the horse barn and things can happen accidents can happen but we train we educate we spend time um, and we um, invest in the employees and, and that's at every level whether it's at the volunteer agency or the career agency it doesn't matter we put uh, the safety of them as the utmost importance and we teach them the ways that's why we're a lot of folks give the fire service or public safety in general a lot of grief over um, tradition and you know holding holding to the values of tradition well tradition has paved the road in a lot of very scary scenarios for people and uh, so there's a lot to be gained from not disregarding the history or past of, of the fire service uh, just because it's it's deemed as a, a traditional bound item and uh, you know so we can learn a lesson but we continue to grow so um, I definitely don't think we get as much of that conversation of well you know why would you be a firefighter that's dangerous I don't think we we get that at near as often as possibly as what the law enforcement does um, and especially in today's world but um, yeah no doubt that the education and the experience and training is what we're going to put in front of them so help them make the right choice and the right decisions so what do you think what are the characteristics of someone who will be successful in what you do. So for instance, like in the work that I do, it's very important to be interested in people. I mean, like very interested in their story and be curious about that makes a person a good therapist. Uh, but there got to be qualities in being law enforcement or being a firefighter that make you good at what you do. If you like to light stuff on fire. <laughs> you, today we've you already love, had this discussion. You love <laughs> campfires. <laughs> If you love light, lighting firecrackers, I would think, I think right there you put the, that on your resume. The profession of fireman is not fire starter, right? It's, it's oh, uh -huh. putting out fire. Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you. I couldn't start a fire if my life depended on it. So. <laughs> you yeah, put them out, you. right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead. And Jennifer, to your point, I mean, there is, you have to be people people centric and people minded. I mean, we interact with people on a daily basis and in all types and manner of, of situations. So yeah, you can't be, uh, you can't be shy about interacting with people. But um, I think someone who's, who's service minded, um, unselfish, you know, and willing to, to sacrifice and put themselves out there for others. Uh, someone who exercises good judgment, uh, patient, you know, slow to anger, um, willing to, to work through problem solve and, and, uh, uh, and inquisitive and curious. I mean, those are all qualities I think that, that, uh, that we look for to make a, a good police officer. Thanks. When we're looking at, for us, it's, there's work ethic that comes along with it too. Um, I, one of the things that I tell kids that are in, and that are in school that we're talking with is, um, you know, you, you need to be you need to be genuine with who you are because it's not necessarily going to be a fit necessarily um, just because it doesn't fit with the organization because we're going to hire based upon your morals your ethics and your values um, i can teach you skills i can teach you hard skills i can teach you how to drag a hose i can teach you how to put a fire out how to do emt skills all those things are skills that can be taught morals ethics and values are, are very difficult to um, to do anything about once they're set they're set so we do a lot of work to, to push towards that but work ethic and integrity and then compassion uh, like what chief williams was saying we don't get to pick the time that we interact with the community or interact with the citizen and just because we don't feel like it's an emergency does not mean doesn't mean that it isn't to them so uh, it's their emergency and we, we just don't get to judge based upon that so and then the last one I have for us is just camaraderie. They need to be able to be a part of a family and um, depend on each other. Um, we, we depend on our, the brotherhood, the, the family dynamic of the fire service, not just because we need somebody to help save our lives if something were to get uh, sideways, but also for counsel. It's, we need to be able to be together and uh, trust each other and have that integrity with each other. So those are kind of the, the principles that push 
folks into the fire service into that that um, that public safety mindset. I do love Chief Reynolds or Chief Williams' piece for servants too. That servant leadership um, it it shows itself really easily. Servant leadership does. You'll see uh, folks that progress through the ranks fairly quick, and uh, it's almost it's pretty easy to find that servant leader that that steps up every time, and they do it for somebody else. It's not for them. So we, you know, we've talked a little bit about the danger and we've talked a little, we talk a lot about some of the good things, but every job, you know, like for teachers is often grading papers and some of the parents, uh, for tax, for accountants, it may be tax season, but there are going to be some difficult things about jobs that people have to get used to. So what would you say realistically? What are some difficult things that you would say, this is part of your life as a law enforcement office officer or in the fire service? Yeah, I'm sure you meet some cute ones out there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start with that and say, you know, day to day, you see people at their worst and mm -hmm. you see some of the worst conditions that, uh, that, people live in that you wouldn't you would never go into those places or or go see those people um and that's kind of a common occurrence uh, you know people generally don't call the police when they're having a good day they don't call us to say hey come over and, and see what you know what a, what a great relationship i have with my neighbor uh, or my spouse it's it's always on their worst day uh, they've been the victim of a crime something bad has happened so there's not a whole lot of good stuff that's why you know we we push and, and COVID's been been terrible for that because we had to cancel all of our community events, all of our neighborhood meetings, all of our positive uh, opportunities to interact with the public. And officers are focused only on those, you know, nine one one calls and and uh, and arresting people and, and dealing with the bad stuff that comes along. And 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 that's been much more prevalent. So, and then internally, it's you know, Scott talked about it being a family. I mean, it's it, it's a brotherhood. It's a sisterhood. We. We're a team. We care about each other. And when someone's hurt or killed, you know, we've experienced that this year in, in two very specific instances that, that Officer Christopher Walsh was, was killed in line of duty first time in 80 years here in Springfield. And then just a short time after that, Officer Mark Creeby seriously injured, you know, life-altering injuries. And so I say for me, it's like one of my kids. You know, I, I'm, and I'm old enough now that they pretty much all could be my kids, but it's a, you know, when you're the chief, it's a, you're, you're the patriarch and, and I, I treat them that way. And so, but for everyone else, it's like their brother or their sister. And, and uh, so think of that, if something like that happened in your family, how you would react to that. So, and then having to go back and do the job uh, every day that you were doing that resulted in that um it's, it's it's what makes it very trying and difficult and is unlike any other job other than other than the military that uh, that's out there yeah, yeah. thank you yeah. for sure uh, for us the schedule's not bad i gotta go i i got a prop for the schedule so <laughs> one day a week or two days a week now what is it <laughs> <laughs> it's two thank you two, so, see, two. <laughs> <laughs> on on a hard week it's three. So our guys, the the crews here at Battlefield are on a forty eight ninety six. So they work two days on and then they're off for four. So they're they're in quarters or in station available forty eight hours. Uh, before it was a twenty four forty eight. So they'd be on a day and off for two. Still, I mean, that's the schedule I grew up in um, as I was coming through the fire service. Twenty four forty eights. Our guys love guys and gals love this forty eight ninety six. Uh, because it gives them more time at home with the family. But it also means you're going to be gone from your family for 48 hours at a time. So uh, initially, that can be fairly stressful. Um, so the schedule, though, I, I got to give props. It, it is nice. I would love for the fire chief schedule to be on a 4896, but I haven't found anybody that will let me do that. So, um, And then uh, the feeling of accomplishment in these careers is very high. Um, the adrenaline that comes from our response to calls and uh, and then seeing even on a on a negative outcome, we still feel like there's an accomplishment that we have made towards the betterment of the community. Um, you know, we're we're mitigating hazards, we're mitigating issues at every step of the of the way, and uh, so we look for those ways to serve. So it gives us that feeling of accomplishment. See some some people that go. Uh, you see some stories that come out where. Firefighters are on the scene of a of a horrific event, but they they stay after later 
to help the spouse clean something up. It gives them a, a feeling of accomplishment after the fact of, that they're able to serve community and public. Um, we had an awesome thing happen the other day in our district where a crew helped deliver a baby in a home. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, awesome stuff. And uh, But they stayed after and helped the family clean up the kitchen uh, because obviously when you have a baby in your home, you can make a mess. So they, they stay and they help and they clean up and they do things. So uh, w they look for those, those chances. So the accomplishment is high. Unfortunately, so is the stress. And so is um, the physical exertion that comes along. Number one killer of the fire service is, is heart attacks. So we put a lot of focus and effort on public or on uh, employee health, employee wellness, mental health, and mental wellness. Um, so there's it's give and take, right? You know, it's, there's going to be aspects of it that we just don't like. Chief Williams is right. We're going to see them at their very worst day. Um, but when stuff is not going the way they think it should, and they hear a siren coming, we're that voice of calm that's headed their way. To make a difference. Yeah. You guys have any parting words? Um, think about dads talking to their kids. Mm. Well, I'll, I'll close with a recruiting pitch and say <laughs> <laughs> there will always be police officers. Uh, society has asked men and women to step up and, and be that, uh, that thin blue line that, that, that separates the 99% of the public from the 1% that want to do evil and harm. So there's always going to be a need uh, for police officers. So if uh, even in, in times when, you know, economy's bad and, and maybe there's layoffs and furloughs and cutting things, but there's always going to be, uh, be law enforcement. So uh, if, you want a, if you want a job that you're not never going to have to worry about not having something to do, and, uh, you know, you can, you can do it for as long as you want to, uh, man, we are continuously recruiting and, uh, and bringing people on because people are, it's a, it's a, a steady flow, a steady churn of people retiring or, or leaving the profession. So, um, it's a it's a good gig if uh, if you can uh, if you have an interest in it. And then my parting thought is, you have to keep your nose clean. I tell kids this all the time. I I teach at MSU. I talk to my son's friends. I said the one thing you cannot get into law enforcement with is someone who lacks integrity, character, morals, and honesty. So you can't lie. You can't cheat. You can't steal. You can't be arrested and convicted of something uh, and get into law enforcement. So, and it starts early because uh, when we do those background checks, we go all the way back. Um, and, you know, juvenile crimes is we know about, but we don't take it into account. But once you turn 18, you know, you do something along those lines and it will keep you out of law enforcement. So uh, do things right and, uh, and come oh. see me. <laughs> I think for, for me to the parent is, uh, I go back to the why. Listen to your kids' why and um, find out what motivates them, whether it's school or it's, it's otherwise. And then um, formal education doesn't have to be the answer. Um, I'm, I'm a proponent of formal education. I'm a recently accepted grad student to the University of Drury, uh, at Drury University, and I'm, I'm excited for that. But I waited 15 years before I went back to school. Like, I don't, I don't have to do it right out the chute. There's trades. There are um, academies. And we will teach folks how to, how to do this career and make a lifestyle, a lifelong career for them where they're, yeah, they're not going to get rich um, or, or otherwise, but wealth is not only grown in money. So uh, find something that's happy. Find the why and encourage your child to, to get there. And uh, come visit us at the Battlefield Fire District. We'll gladly show uh, the kids that are at the five-year-old grade age around, and they're going to learn to love fire trucks just as much as they can. Anything. So, so bring them to us. Thank Gentlemen, you, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Chief really? Moore and Chief Williams, thank you to Dr. Baker as well. Uh, you guys uh, have a great day. It was nice chatting with you. Yes. Thank, thank you. All. Appreciate the opportunity. Okay. Yeah, you bet.